on page 277 at the bottom of it, the plan of God. We're talking about studying about systematic theology. Marilyn, why are we studying systematic theology? Do you remember? Why are we? Yes. Okay, Sharon, how about, what What have you learned from it? Um, well, what God has, I mean, there's a great, huge plan, and, and he's executing his plan. Yeah. And then we're at a certain point in time. Mm -hmm. How about, how about it, Vincent? What, what's it meant to you? Well, it's just, uh, for me, it's just kind of trying to figure out how God thinks, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. and uh, absolutely complicated and sometimes it, it seems to be contrary to what we think many times mm -hmm. but um, to just basically try to understand God better mm -hmm. how about Brother Ray is it well, turned to, to new it's uh, very important that we can systematically uh, teach what God put in his word and a more deeper theology and understanding mm -hmm. and understanding the concept of things that, uh, that normally you don't get on, on, on just your surface type study yes Okay, like you said, these guys they were all shallow in what they brought. Yeah. There was no real systematic, you know, deep stuff that bring out some really good stuff. But that, that's the way I look at it systematically, like you explained, is that's just systematically put in order in a deeper sense. Mm -hmm. Much deeper sense. So you can understand God's word. How about Carol? Have you got something from this? Today is going to be, uh, I hope, a good lesson. If it's not, it'll be because of me, <laughs> because it's fantastic in the Bible. We're going to look at this. I'm going to read some things to you, and then we're going to go on God's Word, which is always more beautiful, isn't it? God's Word is fantastic. At the end of this page, the plan of God. He who works in an orderly way in nature has not left salvation of man to haphazard and uncertain experimentation. We have cults in the world today. The world is full of cults because of lack of systematic theology. Full of Catholicism, Jehovah Witness, Mormonism, Islam, Protestantism to some extent. Scripture shows us that we that he has a definite plan of salvation. And salvation is salvation plus what? Work plus what? Grace plus what? Zero. Any of the sacraments? You look at the Lord's Supper, you look at baptism, you look at all these things, those are all works, aren't they? What saves you? Faith in God through Jesus Christ. He has a definite plan of salvation. The plan includes the means by which salvation is provided, the objectives that are to be realized, the persons that are to benefit by it, the conditions on which it is available, and the agents and means by which it is to be applied. It may be added that he has only one plan and that all must be saved in the same way from Adam till now. But he's dealt with man in different ways. It's what we call continual revelation. One step at a time. You go from the known to the unknown. You always must go from the known to the unknown. That's why I, in my classes, I go back and I teach what was there before. And we have to have that foundation before we can learn anything else. If they are to be saved at all, whether they be uncivilized or civilized, immoral or moral, whether living in the Old Testament dispensations or in the present time, God has a plan of salvation. The revelation of God's plan and how God's plan can be known 
we must turn to his blueprint, to his schematic, the schematic of God, the scriptures. If there is a God, which there is, and if he has a plan for mankind to be with him, it would be very ridiculous for God not to make known to man the evidence and the plain black and white nature of that plan of salvation. Amen. Even though he revealed it to mankind in different ways and different times. Okay? God's plan can be known. God's plan of salvation can be known and it's and God's plan with man can be known. Jesus said to a ruler in Matthew the 19th chapter and verses 17, If you would enter into life, eternal life, keep the commandments. Now the commandments really would not give you eternal life, would it? Hmm? But it would show you that you needed to trust in one that was greater than you to have eternal life. He couldn't undertake to save himself by good conduct, could he? He might have thought that. All the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees and the Essene, or the, or the, um, the court recorders, <laughs> all came to him to try to pick him apart because they had their way of salvation. Israel had become like Islam and like the Jehovah Witnesses and like the Catholic Church. They had taken away the plan of God and, and put it in a mixer and just gobbled it up and scrambled it until you couldn't tell it what it really was from God's eternal purpose. If you see that Jesus was trying to tell this man that you must do all of these things to have eternal life, you really missed the point. You couldn't do all those things. You're not capable of doing all those things. And therefore you must trust again with God. The Bible is to the theologian what nature is to the scientist. The Bible is to the theologian what nature is to the scientist. A source of unorganized or only partly organized part of facts out of which the formulates his generalizations. You can't take the Old Testament alone and understand the total plan of God without the New Testament. Can you really? You get an Old Testament, and boy, you will be working up a storm, won't you? Killing your chickens and your and your dogs and cats and everything else, trying to attain eternal life. But there were promises there that were revealed in the New Testament. But they were dark sayings to them back then. They were hidden. It's very unsafe for a scientist to draw conclusions before he has made a sufficient number of of inductions so as it is unsafe for a Bible student to formulate doctrines out of an isolated or insufficient number of proof text like the Church of Christ does with baptismal baptized for the remission of sin you know what the KJO is how many of you know what KJO is write it down right now KJO King James only. There are so many Baptists that, that will not have anything but King James only. But when you look at the King James Bible, you have to realize that every one of those translators were Episcopalian or Church of England theologians, and the King of England told them, don't you translate anything in there contrary to what we believe and doctrine in the Church of England. Amen. And it was written directly against the Baptists and the Church of Rome. Yes. Yeah, uh, I heard a pastor when he was doing a sermon. I mean, he just these and thou the whole sermon. I mean, he definitely he think that's the number one Bible, King James. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's absolutely. You'll hear that in Missionary Baptist ranks. You didn't hear it while Brother Hubbard was alive. And I guarantee you, when I was teaching down at CMBI, the King James had no weight. I was talking to Brother Buttermore yesterday for about three and a half, four hours. <laughs> Marilyn thought I had abandoned her or something. I did. <laughs> they said, where's your wife? And I said, she's putting up with me. <laughs> we were studying together and talking together. We were talking about this problem among the Baptists. They are ignorant, willfully ignorant. Willful ignorance. That's exactly what happened to the Pharisees, wasn't it? Yep. The Sadducees come up with Jesus of that deal. This man died with a wife. And she married all of his brothers. And which one will she have in the resurrection? Which one will have her in the resurrection? All of them? Jesus said, you err not owing the scriptures, number one. Because you don't believe in eternal life. You don't believe in the resurrection. You don't believe in angels. You don't believe in the power of God. That's what he told them. There will be a resurrection. Nowhere in this principle is it more important than the study of the doctrine of uh, soteriology, salvation. For in no field are there more differences of opinion, and in no study are the conclusions more far-reaching and diverse than the study of soteriology or salvation. I was, when I preached last Sunday morning, I had to get up at 4.45 to preach last Sunday morning. Because <laughs> I have to go through my regimen with my body and everything. It's falling apart. And I had to be down there preaching by 7 o'clock. Uh, almost 20 miles away. And I got down there on time and everything. We had a large congregation. Very large congregation. Unbelievers too. I preached cowboys in the Bible. And I'll preach that for you one of these days. Cowboys in the Bible. Oh, I threw some dynamite little pieces in there now and then. Kaboom, kaboom. People's eyes got real big. And they were learning. You could just see them. Just like, like I threw a punch at them. Dodge almost. When we got up there, the former professor of church history at Masters University, John MacArthur's college down south, he, 40 years he taught that. He came up there and he said, wow, wow. He said, boy, you're a Bible storyteller, you know, like that. He said, we need to record all kinds of stuff. And I said, it's out there already. <laughs> <laughs> it's out there already. Here, just look at this. <clears throat> People came up and they wanted, and then we went up to my house, and they saw the the Bob the the trail of blood on the wall. She said, "Please, please tell us about that. Please, 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 give us a short sermon on that." So I did. They said, "Wow, it's all falling together. It's all falling together." God dealt with mankind in many different ways and many times. In Galatians, the fourth chapter, let's look there. Galatians chapter 4. And we're on page, we're down to the bottom. The outline of God's plan of God's plan of salvation there on that one. And then we the methods of God. That page 278. Now I say as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from the slave altogether. Although, i got to change the glass. I can't see what I'm doing. <clears throat> Differ from the slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under the guardians and management until the date set by the father. He's under the steward. So also we, while we were children were held in the bondage under the elemental things of the world. 
But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born and made of a woman, made under the law. That was the whole purpose of Genesis 3.15. In this book, the writer says that the woman evidently believed that Eve, when Eve bore Cain, she seems to have thought on page 279 that he was the promised redeemer. For she said, and they got a perfect translation of this in Genesis, the fourth chapter and verse one. I have gotten a man at Jehovah, even Jehovah. I talked to Brother Brother Moore yesterday and I was translating John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.14, 1, John 1.18. 1, I said, wow, 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 wow. Brother Larry Crouch, when he was teaching in the seminary at FMBI, he called me on the telephone one time. He said, Brother Phillips, he said, are you busy? And I said, not too busy to talk to you. He said, Brother, would you give us a translation? Can you? He said, I know you don't need a Bible. Would you translate John 1 and 1 for us and 114 and 118? Would you do that for this class of students so they can see what is in this dynamite passages of Scripture? Then I did. You could hear them, wow, 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 in the background. I did that in that church, cowboy church up there, when I told them that God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, that we might have eternal life. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons, weothesia. That's the word in Greek. The placing as sons. Heirs. Heirs of eternal life. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, saying, Abba, Abba. Abba Father Abba that's Hebrew you know Aramaic Abba Father therefore you are no longer a slave but a son churches enslave people constantly don't they Jehovah Witness there was a, play, a man wrote a book 30 years of Watchtower Slave there was a man 50 years in the church of Rome Charles Chinoquay they talked about being enslaved by these systems of theology, false systems of theology. Islam. How many people this year died terrible deaths because of Islam? And how many Islamists died those deaths when they blew themselves up? Because of bad theology. Not knowing systematic theology. You are heirs through God. However, at the time when you did not know God, you were slave to those who were by nature no gods. Jehovah Witness, Mormonism, Islam, Catholicism. The gods that they serve are not your God. They're not. Well, Jehovah Witness, they say that Jesus was the first creation of Jehovah God. Why, Jesus is Jehovah God. And that he created all things that we see in the world. That, that this a God, the Son of God, created all of the things. But he was yet a creation. You just destroyed who God is, didn't you? Catholicism, the seven sacraments of the, of the Catholic Church. Change the whole nature of God. You don't have to suffer anything to get to heaven. Jesus Christ suffered all things for you. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, made under the law. 
that you might have eternal life. At that time when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who which by nature are no gods, those system, systems of theology which are no way related to the church of the, Jesus, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you have turned back to the weak and worthless elemental thing to which you were desired to be enslaved all over again? Two times in my life I've known people that were so-called Baptists. One man uh, on the radio that I knew uh, many years ago, he uh, sat under some of the greatest men like Devance Havener and heard them preach. He even heard my preaching. And yet he went and joined up and lined himself up with the Catholic Church. For what? Why would somebody go to, to idolatry? when you no, had known the Lord Jesus Christ or supposedly had known the Lord Jesus Christ my own family I've seen that happen lack of exposure to systematic theology how would anybody with one eye and half a brain go into a cult if you know God and you knew how to interpret God's word why would you go into a cult why would you go into, why would you go into Islam why would you go into the Jehovah's Witness cult? Or Mormonism? Mormonism is so mixed up that they change the whole nature and, and God, that God is nothing but a man. Yep. In Ephesians, the third chapter. But before we go there, Let's go to Genesis. Genesis, the ninth chapter. Before we go to Ephesians, the third chapter, we have to go to Genesis, the ninth chapter, because Genesis, Ephesians, the third chapter, explains Genesis, the ninth chapter. Genesis, the ninth chapter. And I've done this, and I hope you get not get sick of it but I hope you can just repeat it as I say it I go here all the time because it's extremely important that you get this down you go from the known to the unknown don't you so you have to know this this is one thing you have to know now Noah woke from his wine and knew that uh, the thing which it was uh, his youngest son had done to him and he exclaimed this is a prophecy. This is prophecy. Okay? Prophecy. What does prophecy mean? Prophecy. Okay, it comes from pro and phasia. Okay, that's a Greek term. Prophecy. Pro means what? Before. And phasia means to say before. So what prophecy is, is you say something before it happens. All the prophets of God spoke of one thing. The Lord to come. All the prophets pointed to Jesus. Muhammad pointed to himself. That's a difference in a real prophet and a false prophet. Prophets in the Old Testament did not point to themselves. They pointed to the Messiah to come. And that's what's going to happen right here. Cursed be Canaan, he shall be the servant of servants to his brethren. He also said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Shem means what, Sharon? Name or monument, pillar. Through the children of Shem, God would bring forth the Messiah, would he not? But that Messiah is going to be related to us Gentiles too. How? Rahab the harlot, Ruth the Moabitess, 
and blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And may God enlarge Japheth. What does Japheth mean? Spreading. And let him dwell in the tents of Shem. And that's exactly what Ephesians, the third chapter, says. Write Ephesians, the third chapter, right here in your Bible in Genesis. This is what it's talking about. Also, Galatians, the fourth chapter. Write that down. It's very important because this is it. This is the story. This is systematic theology. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. Let him do his job. I am preaching the gospel today because the Jews won't do it. Is that true? I'm preaching the gospel today and I'm about as Gentile as you can get. Because I'm dwelling in the tents of Shem today. And let Canaan be his servant. Now let's go back to Ephesians, the third chapter. Ephesians chapter 3. All right, the book of Ephesians. Who wrote the book of Ephesians? Who's speaking? Huh, Paul. Who's he speaking to? This is a trick question. All the churches, because the Ephesian letter is what? A circular letter. It's a general epistle. It is not to the Ephesians. It was known as the Ephesian letter because it was sent out from Ephesus and copied so many times. So what we have here is a general epistle to all New Testament churches. And let's see what in the world the Lord's got to say about that. Let's start out with verse number 1. We might as well get the whole chapter, even though the chapters weren't inspired. It was all one, one verb, one book. For this reason, because I preached to you, are thus built together. I, Paul, am a prisoner of Jesus the Christ. For the sake of and on behalf of you Gentiles, Sharon, are you a prisoner? Are you a prisoner? Are you a prisoner of Jesus? Oh, Jesus? He took your heart captive, didn't he? Are you a prisoner, Vincent? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A willing prisoner. We're all prisoners of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're willing prisoners. For the I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake of and on behalf of you. Now, was Paul really a prisoner? Yes, yes he was. Why was he a prisoner? Because of Jesus and because of us. If we're prisoners of the Lord Jesus Christ today, we're prisoners for each other to build each other up. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God, stewardship, that comes from the word styward. Styward. <clears throat> That's an old English term. Oikonomia. The stewardship. Styward is the English, old English term. You know what a sty is? Mm -hmm. It's a pen. Mm -hmm. It's a corral. A sty. A sty is a corral. Ward is what? It is a person over that. And what this term came from is that basically the king and princes of England, they owned everything, including all the people. And they used to think that God had appointed them as ambassadors on this earth because they were born kings, that they were supposed to watch over everybody and everybody is supposed to serve them. We're all servants of the one mighty king and that he was sitting on the throne. He was God's king on the throne. Now if you look back, 
in the history of mankind, almost every king that sat on any throne always considered himself blessed of God, and that he everything he said was right, and it was ex cathedral. And the first, what we call holy, Ro holy Roman emperor, was up here Constantine. When he sat on the throne, he said everything that he said was ex cathedral. What came out of his mouth was God's law. Have the council in Nicaea, where he figured out what all the Bible was supposed to be. And then they said that he was the apostle of God. The Bible has the apostles all right. That was the first gift placed in the church, wasn't it? First gift placed in the church was the apostles. And it was a gift. Apostle means what? It comes from two Greek words. What? Apostello. Apostello. One sent forth with authority. With a divine majestic authority. An apostle. One sent forth with divine majestic authority. And what did those apostles do? They wrote your Bible. I had a very interesting encounter and relationship with people up there in Fish Lake Valley this last weekend from Friday on. They looked at me like I was apostle almost after I preached. And I could answer all their questions. When I went and taught about church history then woman came, one came to her eyes with me and her, her son had gone into a false religion. And she started telling me questions. She said, was the church first or the Bible? I said, well, the only Bible that the church had was what? Students, the Old Testament. But as God sent forth the apostles and inspired them as he did the apostle Paul here, Who's speaking? Paul the Apostle. Who's he speaking to? All the churches. What's the purpose of this letter? To tell us about systematic theology. And I explained to her that the Bible was revealed through the church. Amen. But the idea of the church is not Catholicism and is not the Protestant Fathers. The Bible had already been revealed by 100 A.D. We have it. We have the complete Word of God. Assuming that you heard of the Stiward, the stewardship, the Stiward was the man over the king's pens, his cattle, his pigs, his sheep, his horses, war machines. They took good care of them. I think I told you about all those Mustangs up there in the wild in the wilds in Nevada came from those Lipazon stallions at one time. Where'd the Lipazon stallions come? They were war machines. England had heavy horses. Henry the Eighth had all of the horses killed that weren't 16 hands and lower. The only ones that lived through that massacre was those Welsh ponies in the coal mines, those short, strong ponies. Because they had to carry all that armor. And some of that armor on the horse and on the man would be two or 300 pounds that a horse had to carry, extra besides the person. And when they came out with bullets and guns, that armor had to be double plated to stop the bullets from killing the knights. We see all of this, these knights. We are knights, people. We are God's knights. You ever heard of the Knights Templar? The Knights Templar? That's the Catholics. The Catholics, the Knights Templar, come out. They were going to take over the Holy Land again. 
people keep trying to say that the Crusades were wonderful. Without the Crusades, we would all be speaking Arabic today because the Muslims had gone into Egypt. I'm not Egypt, but Europe. Yeah, they were there. Where did Muhammad get his idea of conquering by the sword? Roman Catholicism. Without Roman Catholicism, there would have been never a Muslim. Did you know that? Everything he got, the indulgences, everything, all these ideas, conquered by the sword, and paying his soldiers by booty. That's what the Knights Templar did later. All they did was what Islam was doing. They weren't one better than Islam, one, better, one bit better. They went into the land of Palestine. There were some Jews there, always. Some of them always stayed there, but they went in the land. They were going to take it over, and they killed all the Muslims there. Both of them murderers. How many of you got American Express or, or Discover Card or Visa? Anybody? You know where that was invented? By the Knights Templar. Did you learn something new today? Obviously. The Knights Templar. The Knights went into the land of Palestine, took over the holy places, and they say they went down underneath the Temple Mount and found very, very precious items. And they were only nine of them to begin with, and then there became hundreds and thousands of them. And the Knights Templar owned property all over Europe. Switzerland. Switzerland. The Swiss banking system was probably by the Knights Templar. How many of you ever seen the, the Swiss? The Swiss Army Knife? That's Knights Templar. People went and, and tried to conquer them one time, and, and the Knights Templar after about 1100, 1200 A.D. were banned, but they were still there. They went into Germany, they went into Switzerland, France. and France. Well, France is where they were arrested mm -hmm. as being heretics. But they had money, 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 money. How did they get all that money? They went into the land of Palestine and they became bodyguards for all of those Christian so-called uh, tourist. But when he came in there, then they realized that, hey, we can do something better than this. If you don't have any money on you, you can't be robbed, can you? Why, hobos aren't normally robbed, are they? <laughs> so the nice Templar went in there and, and said, we will give you script. And it's worth so much money. You go in there, you deposit all of your money with us. All your jewels, all your property, deeds, everything with us. You go into the promised land and you take it and you bring back this credit card invoice of what you used. When you come back, we'll deduct all of what you used there and we'll give you back your money. And the Pope waved that they could charge interest because, listen to this, people. Did you know that in the history of the world, interest has been taboo with banks because of crooks? And all the banks now, they charge exorbitant interest up to 20-something percent interest. And when you get a savings account, you won't get even 1% interest. Yep, right. And most of the time in human history, banks have been forbidden to charge interest. And those Jews set up those hawk shops. Hawk shops are banks because they wouldn't let them have banks. And so they started dealing in diamonds. Well, all of your American Express and your Visa, Bank of America cards, whatever it is, all started back with the Knights Templar. They invented it. Crazy. What was wrong with all of this? Bad systematic theology. bad systematic that I could go in and talk for an hour all about all of that stuff this history but this just a little drop here and a little drop there to make you think 
Let's go on. How the mystery, the secret, was made known to me, and I was allowed to comprehend it in direct, by direct revelation, as I already briefly wrote to you. When you read this, you can understand my insight into the mysterion of Christ, the secret of Christ, the secrets. Secret societies. Out of the Knights Templar, many people believe that the Masonic Lodge came. Did you see the Da Vinci Code? All of that, that's all this Knights Templar stuff. It's, it's kind of different avenues where it goes in these mysteries and secrets, so-called. This mystery was never disclosed to human beings in past generation as it has now been revealed to his holy what? It wasn't Constantine. It wasn't, Mo it wasn't Muhammad. It wasn't Joseph Smith. It wasn't Charles Taze Russell. It wasn't Mary Baker Eddy or Mary Ellen White. The apostles. Consecrated messengers. Majestic messengers from majestic powers. Prophets by the Holy Spirit of God. It is this. That the Gentiles, Genesis 9, 25-27, the fulfillment of that. That the Gentiles are now to be fellow heirs with the Jews, members of the holy body, joint partakers sharing in the same divine promise in God through the acceptance of the glad tidings of the gospel. Genesis 9 and verse 25 to 27 talked about the gospel. Genesis 3.15 was the gospel. Not fully understood, but it was the gospel. Of this gospel I was made known, or I was made a minister, administrator. According to the gift of God's free grace, an undeserved favor which was bestowed upon me by the exercise and the working and energizing and the effectiveness of, effectiveness of his powers. To me, though I am the very least of all saints of God's consecrated people, I feel that Every time I read that, I am lower than an earthworm. When Crazy Horse, that was a shirt man among my family. I'm related to Crazy Horse. There even were political marriages among the American Indians. Now, Crazy Horse fell in love with this beautiful girl and his father had promised her to him and he courted her and he played music for her and he spoke sweet things to her and he walked with her and then her father was wrong wronged him her father greatly wronged him a very powerful warrior came and to get a political alliance with that warrior he gave crazy horses future wife to that warrior He betrayed his promise to Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse was a shirt man. A shirt man was somebody that was so good and so giving that everybody in the village had great honor and regard for him because he had given himself for them. A very selfless, selfless man, unselfish man. Crazy Horse, five times in his life, gave everything he owned in this world away down to his underclothes his undershorts, breech cloth. He lived for those people he gave. He was a preacher, a prophet, so to speak. They trusted him. And all the women in the tribe went and made a buckskin shirt for him, and everybody that decorated that shirt would put a, a lock of their hair on it. They would braid that hair and put a lock of that hair on it. And he became a shirt man. And a shirt man could go between tribes because no one would touch him because he was holy. When Crazy Horse was broken hearted. And he went to the tent of that man that had stolen his wife and took her back home. 
Even though he was right, he was wrong. And that man came back, and Crazy Horse had a scar on his face. That man came back with a gun and shot him right in the face. He said, not kill him, but it scarred him. And he lost his shirt because he thought more of it, the woman that he loved than his tribe. They had great honor for him always, but he lost that very, 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 very wonderful gift and honor as that shirt. And that's where you get the word lost your shirt. Is that a Losing your shirt. Adam and what happened there? Yeah, also, all the way. These were revelations that the people had, the, the, the Anishinaabes, the human beings had. And if you look at them, it always goes back to the Bible somewhere. Anyway, Crazy Horse was always a preacher and always a warrior when he needed to be. And he wasn't afraid of bullets at all. He wasn't afraid of bullets. Man afraid of his horses, Crazy Horse, Roman no, all these great warriors, they trusted in God. They trusted in Wonka Taco. That's the father. Tonka Sheila. That's the son. It's gone. Taco. It's gone. gone. That's the Holy Spirit. And that's in my language, the Lakota language. Well, we see all these revelations down to the world, but the perfect revelation is the Bible. The perfect revelation. The favor and privilege was granted and graciously entrusted to proclaiming the Gentiles. The unending, boundless, fathomless, incalculable, exhaustless, exhaustless riches of Christ, wealth which no man, human being, could have searched out. That word right there, that's one Brother Hubbard used to look at, that Greek word there, that means untrackable. Yeah. The untrackable riches of God. Those riches that cannot be tracked down. They cannot be tracked down. To also to enlighten all men and make plain to them what is the plan regarding to the Gentiles and providing for the salvation of all mankind. Genesis 9, 25 to 27. Of the mystery kept hidden from the ages and concealed until now in the mind of God who created all things by Christ Jesus for the purpose is that through the church the complicated many-sided wisdom of God in all its indefinite or infinite, that is, variety and innumerable aspects might be made known to angelic rulers and authorities, principalities and powers in heavenly places. And this is in accordance with the terms of eternal and timeless purpose which he has realized and carried out into effect through the person of Jesus Christ in whom because of our faith in him we dare to have the boldness and courage and confidence and freedom of speech and access an unreserved approach to God with freedom and without fear. Vincent, what song do we have? 485. 485. Jesus Christ through the church. And that's us and Brother Ray has decided to make known the unsearchable riches of God. Amen that in times past were hid. And if you're out there this day listening to this message, we give you the, the offer of salvation by the authority of Jesus Christ if you believe in him. We are only messengers of God's word. If you believe that God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, that he lived and died for you on the cross of Calvary and was raised again. And if you believe in him and trust in him for salvation, you shall be saved for whosoever shall call upon the name of Jesus, the Lord shall be saved. For the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And in our heart, we are saved when we believe that. That's simple. That's too simple for most of the world. Yeah. But that's the story. That's the grace of God. For in grace you are having been saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, a lot of works, lest any man should boast. Mm -hmm. Brother Vincent. Joy when I shall wake within 
the palace of the king. And I shall see you face to face and tell the story, say by grace. And I shall see you face to face and tell the story, say by grace. If you're listening to this message wherever you are, God's got something for you. Something in this message will touch your heart because it's truth. It is the basic truth of all of God's Word. And we are caretakers of that truth today. Our Heavenly Father, we send your Word out for you, for your honor, for your glory, that those that out there that will believe will have eternal life and that those that believe will give their lives to you, they will serve you in the best way they can wherever they are. That they will try to support your work wherever it may be in the world. And Father, forgive us where we fail you. Help us to be stewards of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, how many pages did you cover just a moment? Thank you.